Weizmann Institute, who uh, finished his PhD in uh, 93 at uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. He was then a postdoctoral post researcher at the uh, Max Planck Research Group for Non Classical Radiation in Berlin and at the Oregon Center for Optics. Then he was a professor for physics at the University of St. Andrews in the UK from 2000 to 2012. And since 2012, he's been at the Max Planck Today is going to tell us about surprises because we have physics. Right, uh, so thank you very much for coming. And if you're interested in cosmic physics, <coughs> I hope you find something surprising uh, in it. I didn't when I entered this field. So I thought that uh, everything is known in the field of cosmic physics. And yet, to my own surprise, we discovered uh, quite a number of things that uh, we found were quite remarkable and that have not been discovered before. And so what are cosmic forces? So these are, we are talking about forces of the quantum vacuum. And uh, the story, I forgot to say, the story is told in, uh, as the stories of four people involved in this part of research. So these are three students and one postdoc. And let me begin with the first student. Uh, his name is William Simpson. And he joined me when uh, I was still at the University of St. Andrews in the UK. When he joined me, his greatest worry was that having studied at the uh, University of St. Andrews, he originally thought he should get uh, more experience. He should move somewhere else. And so he asked me whether it's possible to combine this, that he also get some experience in other places. And yes, he did. So, uh, and quite a lot. So, among, uh, apart from travels, he went to the University of Trento to work with Lev Kajewski. And then later, I dragged him to the Weizmann Institute. He didn't know that at the time. And uh, there he was finishing his PhD thesis. His PhD thesis got a Springer Award uh, for, uh, for the uh, thesis and appeared as a book as the title Surprises in Theoretical Cosmic Physics. Then he returned to St. Andrews and worked in theology and philosophy and now he's doing his second PhD in philosophy in Cambridge and he wants to become a professional philosopher, someone who's able to connect science and the philosophy with his, his two PhDs. And so that's the, uh, the person I started with in the work of Casimir Force. Without him, I would not have entered uh, this field and uh, far from some amateurish uh, considerations. So let me explain first what this is about. So the Casimir effect. The Casimir effect is an uh, effect of vector fluctuations in materials, typically in dielectrics, and its simplest case. <coughs> Um, as it was theoretically discovered by Casimir, it is a force between two, let's say, dielectric plates. So these are plates in complete vacuum. There are no charges on them. There are no other forces acting upon them apart from vacuum fluctuations. And the effect of those fluctuations is that these plates attract each other. Now, the modern area of Casimir physics <coughs> began with the physician experiments in this field, they started, they were published first of all in 1997, and then a series of more and more refined experiments were performed that allow, uh, first of all, a, a verification of Casimir's and other theories in this field, and uh, possible generalizations and uh, connections. Now, the Casimir force is related to Van der Waals forces, these are the forces that help stick things together. For example, geckos can climb up walls because the <coughs> hairs in their feet uh, are sticky to the surfaces, and so they effortlessly can, can go. These sticky forces are an issue when it comes to micro machinery. For example, machinery that is integrated <coughs> in electronic chips and that uh, has accelerometers or any kind of sensors or as, as devices that has some mechanical effects. And there the plasma forces become important because they act on very small scales. 
And it has been hypothesized that Casimir forces may also act on very large scales. So they may be responsible for cosmological expansion, but um, that still remains to be seen whether this is actually uh, a workable hypothesis. But they are all around you. So they are responsible for capillary forces. They help uh, water climbing up trees. Without these forces, life would be impossible. The height of trees is limited by Casimir forces, or capillary forces that are related to them. And so let's have a closer look into this physics. And I also begin with the simple example of Henry Casimir, the Casimir effect between two perfect mirrors in the vacuum. And now what you know about uh, quantum mechanical fluctuation forces is that even in perfect vacuum, there still are fluctuating fields, for example, fluctuating electric and magnetic fields, and they result in an energy that doesn't go away even in the limit of absolute zero temperatures, the zero point energy. And the energy of the Casimir forces is given by the sum of all the zero point energies of the modes involved in the system. So if you have, for example, a one-dimensional system, as shown here, that's the simplest possible case, then what you have to do, you have to sum over all of these energies. These energies are simply proportional to the number of nodes in your modes. And so essentially what you're doing, you're summing up over all the integer numbers, and uh, you are uh, getting then you're getting a prefactor that depends on how uh, which dimensions you're working, also to h bar and c, and then from the summation over the modes you get a large infinity because the uh, sum of all the integers is of course infinite. However, in Casimir physics, the sum over all these uh, infinite, infinitely many energies is not infinite, but it's a negative number. This is the same as saying that the sum of all integer numbers is minus 1 over 12. This is what you get in Casimir physics. How do you get it? And one way of getting it is the following. So that what you do in these summations of zero-point energies, you replace the uh, integers in that case by integers to some power, power of minus s, and that gives you a well-defined function. That's Riemann's zeta function. And then you just take the value of this function where you want to, where you need it, and then that case would be minus one, and then you get minus one over 12. The meaning of this is the following. <coughs> so this function as a series of integers to some power, is of course only defined in the complex plane within some convergency circle. And so this is where you, this function is defined. And then what you do is you analytically continue. You analytically continue around the singularity that inevitably occurs because uh, this series is diverging. And, uh, and then you are analytically continuing to minus one where you get the value of minus one. But this is one way of <coughs> removing the infinities that are occurring in Casimir physics. It's one way of, of renormalization of uh, Casimir physics theta function renormalization. There's another one, and that is inspired, or that originates from another type of theory that describes Casimir physics, which was pioneered by the three gentlemen you see here, uh, Lifshitz, Pitajewski, and Jalajinsky. <coughs> And they understood this, the Casimir force, as a generalization of van der Waals forces. And developed a theory based on fluctuation dissipation theorems that uh, connects the uh, quantum mechanical forces like the Casimir force to classical electromagnetic propagation. So the central quantity that's computed there is the, the classical electromagnetic green functions. In knowing these functions, you can then compute the cosmic forces. You also have to perform a regularization, of course. And that's a method that uh, these days has been turned into a powerful numerical tool with which you can compute the forces between uh, 
objects and uh, uh, and especially you can then also include dispersion and dissipation. So the fact that realistic materials depend on frequency and are uh, typically lossy, that's something you cannot do with Casimir type, with, with Casimir's theory, which is set on boundary conditions, with Lisch's theory you can, you can do this because the degree uh, function can automatically take this into account. So that has been a very successful way of uh, theoretical description, but there's still surprises in it, and here comes one of them. So this is an argument you find in this book, and it goes like this. So the, <coughs> the Lipschitz theory works very well for piecewise homogeneous material. In the simplest case, for a stack of layers. So imagine you have, let's say, a bottom layer, then some liquid in between, and then a top layer. So one can calculate from the situation you know, uh, in a way that was worked out by Lipschitz what the stress is that this material experiences, and from the stress you can find the, the force. Now, just make a little modification to this. So, just add a spoonful of sugar to your fluid. And that means that it is no longer hom homogeneous, it becomes inhomogeneous. And the effect of this is that the dielectric properties are also depending then on height. And uh, how you, would you like? How would you treat this case? So, as a physicist, what you would uh, normally do is you would think of slicing. So you imagine that an inhomogeneous material you can approximate by homogeneous uh, slices, and then you take the limit of making the slicing finer and finer, and you should get a good approximation of the actual result. And the surprise was that if you do this, it fails. So this diverges, and there's no way of fixing it. And that was published in, in, in this paper. And this and other paradoxes pointed to the fact that there is a problem with the Casimir force in materials that are not homogeneous anymore, but with, that uh, uh, exhibit dielectric properties that vary in space. For example, in that case, in, in one direction. And that's a problem then that the investigators with a PhD student now at the Weizmann Institute, who started as a master's student and then continued as a PhD student. His name is Vitaly Pagliasti. And uh, it was a difficult process that I, I really, I compared with mountain climbing. So uh, we had to climb some steep walls. And uh, this is something one should not do alone because uh, <laughs> There's a tendency of falling down. <coughs> we fell down uh, several times, and so it's good to have someone who can then hold you and uh, then guide you further, and so on and so forth. And uh, we have, after three years of work, we have then found the beginning of a story of how to deal with inhomogeneous material. And the first point to make is a conceptual one. So there are two ways of looking at the Casimir force. One way is closely related to, if you like, Casimir's original picture. That is the picture of vacuum fluctuations. So the picture shown here in the, uh, in the diagram on the screen, this is a space-time diagram. So this is so one-dimensional, so here is space, and there is time. And it shows you the fluctuations. So it shows you a fluctuating field. It's completely random in space, but then it propagates in time. Now, if you look at space-time diagrams of uh, fluctuations carried by waves, as vacuum fluctuations are, then it becomes organized. So what you see in this picture is you see the light cones. So you see lines of 4 to 5 degrees, and you see the reflections and the boundaries. So you see that vacuum fluctuations get organized, in particular they get organized when you have boundary conditions. And this organization of noise has consequences, and one of those consequences is, is consumer forces. So that's a picture where you take the vacuum fluctuation seriously as a physical phenomenon. 
There is a complementary picture. That picture was very much uh, promoted by William Schwinger in his book on source theory, where it is argued that actually there's no such thing as electromagnetic zero-point energy or fluctuation, quantum fluctuations as the electromagnetic field itself. What occurs as those fluctuations can be traced back to fluctuations within the materials. In terms of Casimir physics, this means that if you have, let's say, two blocks of materials making up the two mirrors and the Casimir cavity, then you can think of them as consisting of dipoles. These dipoles, they're rendered, so they're excited by vacuum fluctuations, and then these dipoles, they interact with each other, and that causes the uh, Casimir force. And to be even more precise, so what you do in this type of formalism <coughs> is that you imagine you have material, you consider one of those dipoles, could be anywhere, and this dipole is split into two points. One is the emitter and the other the receiver of uh, electromagnetic radiation. The emitter is driven by vacuum fluctuation and it sends out an electromagnetic wave. This electromagnetic wave propagates inside of the material and it's scattered, it's reflected and then it comes back. And the receiver interacts with the part of the wave that comes back. And uh, so, by then you can ask, so in this picture, where is, where is the infinity? So all, all of those pictures must contain something that is infinite. Where is it here? And the answer is, it is in the interaction of the dipole with itself. So, the Casimir force is, is made by the part of the wave that comes back. And therefore, what you must do, you must exclude the wave that is directly propagating from the emitting to the receiving end at the molecule. And uh, so what you do is you, uh, you have split the two, in, uh, you have split each dipole into two components. Of course, then you take the limit of um, these two components merging into the same point again. And nevertheless, uh, you have intrinsically within your theory interaction with itself, but this is the point that we must exclude. Now, to show you some, some algebra, and then, uh, it's not only cartoon pictures, um, it's the following. So what we worked out is, what kind of divergencies do you get in situations like this? So you can find that the stress exhibits three types of divergence. One goes with the fourth power of some cutoff in the system, for example, the characteristic wavelength, uh, which, or characteristic wave number at which you cut off, then a contribution that goes with the square of that, and the logarithmic term. The first contribution, that is the one that is typically removed in the literature type theory. That's the dominant one. And uh, that is proportional to the dialectic properties of the dipole at the place where it is located. But there is a second contribution, that's the quadratic, the diverging one. And this contribution, as you see from the formula, depends on the way how the dialectic properties, how the epsilon and mu, how they vary in the space. So this explores the surrounding of the point. And that was the contribution that was not taken account and that's the contribution that you must uh, subtract in the randomization procedure. And finally there's a logarithmic distribution contribution. This logarithmic contribution disappears <coughs> on its own if you have dispersion in the system. So that logarithm then dissolves, just turns into finite contribution to your overall constant stress. So coming back to pictures, so how do you find this outgoing, uh, how they ex exclude the interaction with itself, it amounts to the fact of finding and defining precisely what the outgoing wave is. And then what you do is, you simply subtract from the green functions of uh, the, the total electric the green function, you subtract that outgoing wave. But what is the outgoing wave? So that's, it's, it's an elementary exercise in a homogeneous space 
if we just, if we just spare the way of expanding, but what is it if the host material varies in space? And there we use the tools that come from <coughs> connections between geometry and dielectrics, then connections between, if you like, uh, Einstein's general relativity and Maxwell's electromagnetism, that uh, in its simplest forms says that whenever you have a dielectric material, you can understand it as a curved space, and vice versa, when you have a curved space, you can understand it as a dielectric material, and therefore you can use the tools of geometry to understand what outgoing waves in dielectric materials mean. So that's even more uh, fundamental version of this is Fermat's principle, so we know that light propagates such that it optimizes its traveling time or its, uh, its path, where path length is measured with respect to the refractive index, becomes optimal. And that you can also view <coughs> as establishing spatial geometry for light. These tools we used, and uh, they have been applied in other uh, subjects as well, connected with visibility cloaking, for example, with perfect <coughs> imaging. And the same set of tools can also be used to define what we mean by an outgoing wave. So to make the picture that you see here on the uh, on the screen precise and to tell exactly what uh, what kind of effect we need in order to be able to renormalize the green function of the classical force. That's one aspect. The second aspect is that uh, we need to define the basic properties the basic electromagnetic properties that enter these waves up to some order. So we know that an outgoing wave, or that the, we know that the that divergency of the Casimir stress depends on the property, the dielectric properties at the position and its its variation. And then the question is how how much do you need to expand around this? So how many details do you need to take into account? And it turns out that quadratic order is sufficient. So what we suggest is then to uh, essentially approximate the dielectric index distribution or an epsilon review, whatever you need, in terms in quadratic order and then calculate the outgoing wave with respect to this expansion into a quadratic order. We can show mathematically that uh, this gives you uh, converging results, so this the final product is uh, finite. It also serves as a starting point for calculations. Calculation is simply the subtraction of the, of the green function. And for the time being, these calculations are quite computationally ex extensive. So we needed a uh, supercomputer to, to do that. But this is something I believe can be improved in the future. And uh, if you are interested in the details, that is uh, relatively recent published in this work So to summarize this part of the talk <coughs> in pictures, so uh, we would suggest that there are two complementary pictures behind Casimir force. One is where you take, if you like the Casimir picture, we take 0 0.5 seriously as physical objects. And the other one, the Schwinger-inspired picture, is where you can trace all the quantum properties that you are you're carrying about in the situation back to quantum fluctuations inside materials. There we apply the point splitting method, and the realization in the point splitting method is to identify what the outgoing wave is and then to subtract it. So that's uh, essentially some of the work uh, with uh, time. Now enters another student, Yael. She was a master student with me at the Weizmann Institute, and she looked into another problem. It's a related problem to the uh, inhomogeneous materials. It's a problem of the sphere. It's a homogeneous sphere. So imagine you, are, you have a dielectric sphere with an epsilon and a mu, and uh, this sphere is embedded in a host material of a different epsilon than mu. You want to calculate what is the force of vacuum fluctuations and uh, <coughs> clearly this force can only have uh, the boundary between the two materials. But what does it do? 
but you get uh, something attractive, something repulsive. And the history of this problem dates back to Casimir himself <coughs> and in the 50s, where he. So force acting on what? So the force would be acting on, on, on the sphere itself. So imagine it could react on it. So this is not a completely rigid one, but like a droplet, and it would it would expand, would it contract, would it cause it. That's the question. Well, but there is material everywhere. And there is material everywhere. But so there are no vacuum constraints. This is material. Okay, but well, um, but they are the vacuum fluctuations in the sense so the fluctuations at, at zero uh, temperature. Okay, but still okay. the electric material. Yes, but what you could have, for example, uh, you could have either a hollow in the in the most material, then uh, you could be the vacuum fluctuation inside of this uh, hollow magnetic, or you have you consider a droplet in empty space. And these are the uh, but the argument is that inside the electric material and the vacuum is the same type of fluctuations? That's the uh, argument? No. no. <coughs> and you can work out, so from the fluctuation dissipation theory, you can, you can work out how these fluctuations depend on the, so they depend on the imaginary part of the system. Um, yeah. So, so they are not cutting the forces, they are fluctuation dissipation theory. Whatever, however you call this. So fluctuation is a very zero, zero temperature. That's fluctuation dissipation. No Kazik. It's a name. So no, it's not a name. Physical phenomena. <coughs> so but then you could equally well say that Kazimir forces are only interesting in the case when you have at the very least some boundaries or some materials. So it's the materials that make those forces. Well, without those, you just have empty space and nothing. <coughs> so it's a, it's a generalization of the standard cosmic force. These are forces or preparation forces, if you like, inside of the And the story uh, of the sphere began with, with Kazimir, where he returned with the following idea. So imagine he toyed with a, with a primitive model of, of an elementary particle. So the question is, what makes an elementary particle stable? In never mind quantum mechanics, so suppose you have just um, uh, a classical particle, and if it were a point particle, then it would be unstable. So it would, uh, be, it would get an infinite force it would, that would rip it apart. So there must be some, some stabilization mechanism classically, to uh, keep the particle stable. So Casimir considered, let's say, the toy model of an electron as an, a hollow sphere. So it's a sphere of a perfect conductor. Now the interesting point is this. So then you have two types of forces acting on, on the sphere. One is the electrostatic repulsion, and the other one would be the Casimir force. And the electrostatic propulsion is proportional to the electric field square. The electric field is proportional to 1 over the radius square. So the, um, the energy of the electrostatic energy goes with 1 over the, uh, the radius to the power of 4. And the free factor is the charge, charge square. Now, the Casimir force is proportional to h bar c. And just on dimensional grounds, in order to get an energy density, you need to divide this. So h bar c, h bar omega gives you an energy, c gives you a length. So in order to get an energy density, you divide this by, uh, by a length to the power of 4. The only scale you have is the radius of, of, uh, of this whole sphere. So it must be proportional to 1 over the radius to the form as well. If you now assume that you get a balance between electrostatic repulsion and passing the force, then actually the radius of the sphere drops up. So this could be true even in the limit of arbitrary small spheres, approaching a point particle, that would keep the point particle together. Moreover, the proportionality factor is exactly the fine structure constant. 
So this would allow you to compute the fine structure constant from the Cosmic reinforcement from pure geometry. But you put it by hand. Sorry? You put it by hand that it's the fine structure constant. No, so, so what I put in by hand here is simply the thought put by hand. It's the requirement you have a stable situation. So you want the Cosmic force balanced by the uh, electrostatic compulsion and vice versa. And then it's inevitable. The, the factor you get is the fine structure constant. Or from the factor of A pi or so. But it is this this you can you, you would be able to to work out here. And somebody did the calculation, his name is uh Boyer, was his, his PhD at Harvard University. And in his paper on it, he wrote the following. So he wrote that so considering the apparent beauty of the, of the model, it seems most melancholy to report that the sign is the other way around. So he did not get an attractive force, he got a repulsive force. And then literally everything flows apart. This whole argument doesn't work. Well. And he, in order to achieve this, he needed quite some machinery and also made some additional assumptions concerning randomization, such that Schwinger and his postdocs returned to the problem about 10 years later and solved it more rigorously and confirmed it. So in fact, that the whole sphere is the example where you get a repulsive class, the whole not in a practical And then they also considered dialect spheres. And in particular, his uh, so Schwinger's former student and postdoc, Kibble uh, Milton, did this extensively. He, he devoted his entire career to computing the Casimir force and spheres. And apart from some special cases, he failed, could not have the difference. And this student did it as a master thesis. At least she did it for dispersion as materials, I should say. And just first, a simple argument why the sphere is related to the hollow sphere. So you could run it like this. So the Casimir force on the hollow sphere, you can decompose into two parts. So if you could understand this as a hollow in a perfectly conducting or high index material, and plus that gives you the outside, and sorry, that uh, that gives you the, the inside component of the of the Casimir stress, and the outside component is given by a perfectly conducting sphere and with nothing around it. If you add the two together, you get the whole sphere. So here are the results. When you say a epsilon there, it's an imaginary epsilon or? No, epsilon is real. So let's, okay. So the, uh, so the real electric theory to work typically at imaginary frequency. <coughs> For imaginary <coughs> all dynamic functions are real. So epsilon is real. It can for imaginary frequencies. And then for for real frequencies, you have a real imaginary part satisfying becomes only relations as well as the show that are Okay. And so now in this model, this is not done here. So this is assuming a dispersion of material. So the theory that we developed does not work for dispersive materials for reasons that we're not entirely sure of. So, but we, we think that it's, um, it is quite convincing for dispersion as materials and some of the conclusions are also independent of that uh, assumption. So this is, this is the result. So the, um, the different curves you see, so the, the blue and the green one, they are for uh, spheres and hollows, respectively, and uh, the red curve is the sum of the two. 
And we see that for large epsilon, quite some epsilon, they really approach the uh, limit calculated by Schwinger and postdocs. And, uh, but then there is some interesting behavior in between. So in particular, we can also confirm that the Casimir force of the, the hollow sphere will be repulsive. And for dielectric spheres, there it's, it depends. So it depends on the value of epsilon, what kind of behavior you get. The biggest surprise was if you look at the uh, dependency around one. So for very dilute material, where essentially epsilon is one plus some, some small correction. And there, if you plot this curve, you see it's linear. And uh, that is significant because this implies that it is only proportional to the density and not to the density squared. However, if you use these sort of pictures so that the Casimir force comes about by interactions of molecules with each other, then you would assume that those interactions in the dilute limit would be proportional to the density squared. So, uh, and yet, what we found is that uh, the behavior is linear. And uh, how do you reconcile this? So, we have two pictures here. This is the picture of understanding Casimir forces as a summation of Casimir border potentials so of retarded uh, for the interactions where you assume that you have your uh, dilated sphere is made of atoms and in this picture there are just 100 atoms and they interact with each other parallel so the dilute limit uh, then that's a good approximation and excuse me this, yes why spheres why spheres yeah. and at this point you don't get in planar dilated and I can tell in a second uh, uh, why that is. So, but there, it is actually not so. So there, the, the low density limit is in fact quadratic. And, and that agrees with what you would expect. That if you have, um, so let's say you have two plates, and then the, each molecule, as uh, so a one molecule, one plate is interacting with another molecule, and you would expect that this gives you a quadratic behavior. <laughs> Why is it for the Yes? Why is it It's It's additive in the dilute limit. It's not additive if you have density. That's, that as we mentioned, it's actually, uh, it, it was a challenge. So there were, there were experiments showing this, that these forces are not, not, uh, not additive. It's not so obvious from the But in the dilute limit, that's what you would expect. So, uh, just sum over the, the potentials. You don't have total terms, you don't have quantum uh, uh, terms, and, and so on. Just by uh, uh, potentials. This is one picture. And the other picture is the one inspired from the picture of the, the dipole is split into two that it's explore, sends out the wave exploring its uh, surroundings. And there, you're not talking about two particles, uh, about uh, two molecules interacting with one, it's just one. This, this one can sit anywhere. And it sends out this electromagnetic wave, and this way electromagnetic wave is reflected. You subtract the self direction that's in the picture is done already. And <coughs> then it interacts with the scattering part. Now it turns out that the way scattering occurs in spheres and in Planar geometries is different. So, uh, no, the way how that scattering contributes to the Casimir force is different. So you have, you can show that in planar materials you always need at least two reflections. So you have the two materials, then uh, the wave is sent out, it's reflected once, comes back, and it's reflected twice. These two reflections are then proportional in the dilute limit to the density of the of the material, so you get a quadratic. In a sphere, then uh, it, one reflection is enough to check to contribute already to, to the boundary force. 
That's what makes this effect possible. That, that's what we believe. So that's that was one surprise that comes out from you know, the first surprise was that one can actually solve this problem. And second, that there is something interesting in it that people have not anticipated so far. We have a hard time publishing this, I should say. Uh, but eventually, I hope that it will, it will come up. <laughs> Finally, uh, this is work done with uh, Effie Chamon, who was for a very short time the postdoc with me at the Weizmann Institute. Now he's at uh, Harvard. And his day job is to explore interesting effects of uh, lattices made of atoms, how they interact with light fields. He has shown that uh, it's enough to have. Uh, lattice of single of individual one of uh, two-dimensional uh, lattice of, of atoms to uh, act as a perfect mirror for light, for example, and it's interesting of the mechanical properties and things like this. But we also continue work on Casimir in electronics. But uh, sorry, going back to the sphere, you assume okay. that the atoms are surrounded by perfectly reflecting boundaries. No, uh, then it would get so it's. It's very fluffy. So you assume you just have a, a cloud of atoms in a uh, so good model of photoelectric conservation. It's very fluffy, dilute uh, gas and nothing around. That's the that's sound. No walls. No walls. Then but the you, you reflection have... is from the other atoms. One atom radiates, the other reflects. Okay. Where, where does the reflection come from? No, the reflection comes from the fact that. <laughs> So the, the wave is seen not by just one atom, but by many. So you pick one atom, this, this atom sends out a wave that moves through this fluffy cloud, and on its way it experiences many of those atoms. And it's then part of the atom. Proportionally broader. It's not. It's two atoms. It's not. It's also true. If you just consider two atoms, then you're right. So in the limit of uh, two atoms, of course, you get something that is proportional to the, the, the polarizabilities of the two atoms uh, squared. However, if you take many of those, then that's no longer the case you get a linear behavior. By the way, there is a related experiment done by the Davidson's group at the Weizmann Institute with electrostriction of, uh, of atomic clouds. So you send in a light beam to an atomic cloud, Thomas Law acts as a lens that focuses the beam, and then the uh, the change of the momentum is of course transferred into the atoms of the cloud, and you can measure this. So you can measure what is the direction of that, the direction of that, and it's also linear in intensity, despite the fact that all the interactions are. So essentially, you could argue that the atom sees the light field that all the that at least one other atom has scattered to it, so we would expect it's more dark. And that's ruled out as momentum. It's, it's linear. And that's, I think it belongs to this type of family of What happens in the non retaxic linear? And the non retaxic Instead of passing a folder, you have just. Uh, I think it's essentially the same. So um, I'm not 100 percent sure. So you get you get also interaction. So, so your graph, graph yeah. is your graph it will be taking this more with that because it was to everything was measured in the units of H C. So the formula you have to get so, it will be so the when when this is considered, so when you when you do this calculation with uh, Summing all the forces, you take the first of the <coughs> So your renovation is still this. And uh, so I'm not I don't know whether you made a significant mistake and to in the in the in the building of Okay, just briefly uh, on electronics. Now in electronics you also have uh, dissipation fluctuation behavior, and then you may you have less justification to call this Casimir force, but nevertheless, it's a fluctuation force, and it occurs whenever you have resistance. So, 
dissipation blood pressure physical <coughs> theory. So if you have a, a dissipation as a resistor provides, then necessarily there must be fluctuations associated with that, even in the limit of zero temperature. And then the final temperature is Johnson noise. And for zero temperature, if you have fluctuations, you can view this as fluctuations of currents or fluctuations of voltages. That's a, that's a matter of convenience. And then you can ask, what happens to this? So for example, in the setup as shown here on the left side, uh, left part of the slide, so you have a capacitor connected to, let's say, an, uh, uh, some, some element uh, Z, and this element you can write as consisting of a resistor and some uh, active part IX, so the real part, the imaginary part of the uh, impedance Z, and then you know that the uh, real part, the resistive part, then creates or is associated with fluctuating currents, for example, and then you can ask what is, what is the effect on the capacitor. The capacitor plays the role of the Casimir plates. So you have two plates, but in addition, then, but in this case, you don't have an incomplete vacuum. You connect one of the plates to some other points. That's it. And uh, we investigated this in various uh, setups. So. There is circuit, so you could have another capacitor connected to the resistor, you could have an inductor, and even more complicated circuits uh, that you could link to a capacitor that acts as your measurement device. And you can work out with very simple circuit theory. I don't have the time to show this. You could work out what the consequences are, what kind of potentials you get, and uh, you can. Um, in some cases, you must perform uh, renormalizations. So uh, in other cases, the renormalization is done automatically. So your circuit automatically on its own decouples from the environment in the limit of large frequencies. So inductors typically do this. And that's one uh, theoretical feature. The important practical aspect is that these forces are tunable. So you can tune the electronic response um, rapidly and independently from the, from the mechanical response. And in this way, you can measure independently from the mechanical cosmic forces, you can measure the electronic components. Even if the electronic contribution to the cosmic forces is just a small correction, the fact that it's tunable, that you can, in particular, you can make it time dependent, and uh, independent of the mechanical response makes, makes it measurable in, in a new way. And there, one of the surprises was that uh, you can even uh, exceed the mechanical causing the force. So that's, this we could show for the case where that was insensitive to renormalization, where the circuit on its own renormalized itself, so for, uh, for an inductor. And the reason for this is because you get a different dependence on distance. So distance is translated into capacitance. And uh, the Casimir force is strong for short distances and falls off rapidly, uh, typically with the most for power. Uh, for a lower distance, the calculation was not done with uh, simple models, but for realistic materials where the power dependence is different. And uh, nevertheless, the electronic component has a different power law, and therefore, there is an intermediate regime where it can actually exceed the standard Casimir force. And so that is something that we uh, um, not anticipate before that this is a, it's only a small correction, only the fact that it's tunable makes it actually measurable as independent from the, from the cosmic. <coughs> but what is the result? What's the result? What's the result? So the result, is, there are several results. So for <coughs> the very surface, you can have uh, repulsive components. So you, with a capacitor, you can achieve a repulsive cosmic force, <coughs> or at least the component. So, uh, so this, the electronic contribution does not give you everything. So you have the electronic contribution plus the standard Casimir contribution from the capacitor itself. But because you can change the electronic component, you can influence, of course, how that capacitor responds to, to vacuum calculations. 
And one of the results is that you can achieve uh, repulsive competition to that just by having the capacity. That's one of the results. One quality results. And then we have quantitative results, and that's the one I uh, showed you there. That um, these forces really become comparable to the standard nonlinear force, and we also show that they are measurable. So that uh, the current technology is not out of the range of things that. Is there an H bar in that Of course, there is an H bar. So because it's, it's zero uh, temperature fluctuation, we could also consider thermal contributions to that. We did a focus on the, on zero point fluctuation. It's not because there is zero temperature, it's because it's fluctuation dissipation theorem, therefore there is H bar. It's not related. But uh, if you. No, it's, it was no, no, no. Uh, not true. So if you. The high temperature limit is independent of H bar. So, okay. yes. Uh, high temperature limit and the non zero temperature limit are the same. Yeah, but that's. So it depends what you mean by high. In fluctuation so dissipation theorem. Can you make a discussion earlier? Do you mind just mm -hmm. spoiling it after the talks we were Okay, I'm almost done. So uh, what I'm saying is, to summarize this talk, so it's about uh, four students and uh, their subjects. And these students are very diverse, so starting from a philosopher to an electrical engineer. And uh, they investigated various types of uh, what I believe are these surprising aspects in cosmic physics. If, and if you want to know more about the background of that, not necessarily their immediate work, then you're very welcome to consult this book. So this is something that primarily uh, William uh, compiled with, with a little bit of help with me. And it's called Forces of the Cultivation. It gives you an introduction into cosmic physics, and it's written by some of the young experts in this field. <coughs> And it's written for people who want to understand that and uh, 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 understandable and uh, quite complete ways. So that, uh, there's no cheating in it, but uh, it's, it's less action and set. So it's just, one should make it as, as simple as possible, but not too simple. So this, this book is not too simple. Thank you very much. How the, the quantum numbers, we have three quantum numbers, and how they contribute to the energies 
you need to worry about polarization. You can do this. This is what Casimir did in his, in his paper. I showed you the simple example of one D where everything is, is simple and possible. And it shows already the characteristic feature of, of problems to, to track. But of course, the, the examples we consider are three dimensional for all the polarization. I'm a bit confused with uh, your <coughs> electronics. So if you get capacitor, okay. you probably, uh, due to fluctuations, you probably get plus on one uh, side and minus on the other side. Yes. So I would naively mm -hmm. think that it would lead to attraction, not to repulsion. Yeah, and so uh, this is this shows again how counterintuitive this is. So, um, we would argue that there's always a fraction. And that's true for the Casimir effect in the in the in the bench as well. But unless you have, uh, let's say, you have another material inside of the capacitor. So if you, that's, that's another. So it's another story of retardation. Sorry. Is it a story of retardation? No, no. Um, I didn't. I didn't show you this, but the, the story is following. This is something that already occurred in the, in the early papers of by Lichtenstein uh, and Pilevsky, and it was shown experimentally by Federico Capasso's group at, at Harvard. We have the following scenario: so you have three materials, so uh, a, a dielectric, a liquid, and a dielectric, and these three materials have the following property that the uh, epsilon of the lowest material is the largest, then the second largest, and then the, the smallest on top, or the other way around. So the thing is that you have a definite hierarchy of signs between the materials. Then the cosmic force is repulsive. And this has to do with phase relationships. So you, you know from the Fresnel coefficients that uh, so you get reflections, you get phase changes. And that depends on whether you go from a lower to a higher phase material. And if you have the same phase change, let's say a minus a sign uh, each time, then you get overall an uh, attractive force. If one of the phases has a, has a different sign, you get a, uh, you get a repulsive force. And that happens in this hierarchy of maximum. So for two metal plates, my intuition is correct, yes? Yes. That's, that's true. But as soon as you put something in between, it's no longer, although you would also think it's the same story. So you have uh, dipoles at the surfaces that should attract each other. And yeah, you get a different, a different behavior. Okay. Okay. Just uh, to make it clear, so what you are saying is that there are different prediction in the Casimir and the Schrodinger picture for a sphere. You are getting different prediction. Uh, so the no uh, the so if you like the, the two people who started this so Boyer he worked in the Schwinger uh, sorry in the Casimir picture he summed up the zero point energies and he got exactly the same as Schwinger himself so the two pictures in circumstances so where you have you no know, dispersion they can describe things by boundary conditions. Uh, they they are they are the same. It's not clear why. I would say. I think it's this is also a surprise. Why would you get from something that is involves zeta functions the same as a theory that works with electromagnetic green functions? It's a very very different thing. Yeah. In the in the known cases, you get you get the same answer for. Of course, uh, what I said, the boundary conditions. So there, there is no experimental way to differentiate the two different conditions. Oh. Uh, this. So the only way would be really when they come up with different predictions. And I don't know an example where it's the case. It's, it's, it's possible. Okay, hey, let's thank uh, the